You want to support Roller Mark Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Mark Unfiltered by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. You can make this possible. All right, let's talk about Black Godfather, Reggie Hutland. Um, this is, first of all, it, an absolutely amazing documentary. And what I love is for someone, I, I know Clarence, you know Clarence, but for that person out there who has no idea who the hell this black guy is, he was, he is, not was, he is the man who everybody wants to know. Absolutely. You know, one of the most gratifying things is uh, you see people who, who know Clarence very well who go, you actually got him. You got the whole him, uh, which is very touching. And what is, what is interesting about it, what's interesting about it, again, when you see, uh, when you see the documentary and, and you, you're hearing these stories and you're going, seriously? Seriously? Especially the one where you had CBS and, and making him E.T. and all these different people at the table. And they're like, well, who is Clarence here for? Well, Clarence is actually here for all of us. And how he is the ultimate connector, if you will. Right. That's why I always try to have at least two or more people telling a story. A, just to get all those different perspectives on mm -hmm. it, and also to confirm it really happened. Because these stories are kind of unbelievable. You go, wait, this guy did all those things? And you go, yes, yes, yes. All these things are confirmed. What was also, I think, it, what was important is that when you, when you look at the telling of this story, the fact that you had this white man who was in the business who became um, Clarence's Sherpa, his guide, somebody who said, I am going to show you the business, but I'm also going, uh, I, can, I also recognize something in you that's also valuable for what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an extraordinary experience, uh, an extraordinary relationship between him and Joe Glazier. Um, there was, there was oh, he a, called Mr. Glazier. Always I just, Mr. Glazier. Throughout, throughout the entire documentary, he always says Mr. Glazier. doesn't right. say Joe. No, no. And in the same way, you know, when you are around people who work with James Brown and they only say Mr. Brown, mm -hmm. you just go, oh, that's that old school thing where you do that and you always do that. That person could be gone for 40 years. They will only say Mr. Glazier, Mr. Brown. There's this great story, uh, not in the film, um, where Joe Glazier loved baseball. Uh, he had a section at Yankee Stadium, right, when there was a nameplate that said Joe Glazier, where he sat. <laughs> and so he would call Clarence and go, uh, we're going to, the, going to the Yankee game. Um, pick you up at 6.30. So they'd be walking down to the seats, and Clarence would stop. Because at a certain point, black people aren't supposed to go. So Joe will turn around and go, what's wrong with you? Because oh, I'm not supposed to be done there. So you with me. And not only would he take Clarence down there, he would tell, hey, Governor Dewey, move over. This is Clarence's seat. He said, next to me. <laughs> and he would tell Clarence, just listen, you're going to learn some stuff. That is wild. And, what Clar and then what he is seeing is he is seeing how power is wielded. Yes. And J Joe's statement at the end of that is like, um, this is going to be a little, uh, well, it, you know, in the vernacular, uh, Joe would say, they shit just like you shit. Like, <laughs> there's no reason for you to defer to anyone, whether they're a movie star or a politician, whoever. They're all just people just like you. What's also, I think, compelling about this particular documentary is the fact that here is someone, n not more than a ninth grade education, but it shows people the value of the other education, the one that you cannot get in a classroom. Absolutely. Clarence grew up in an environment where it was a fight to survive. It was a fight to survive in a home with an abusive stepfather. It was a fight to survive in a town you know, infested with Klansmen, 
where you couldn't walk down the street without a possible threat to your life. And so through that, he developed not only the instinct uh, of how to survive, he maintained a value system that said, I'm going to fight for right. And that's quite exceptional because you can get into a survival mode and be very selfish. Well, I, I, you know, I, it's just, you know, I'm fighting to live. I'm fighting to live. And, but it's like, but like, no, no, no. Let's fight for right. Let's fight to protect people who are defenseless. That's a different, higher um, mental state. They actually get me to wind up. I, I know. I'm not... It's it's never gonna happen. No. That's not, <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Y'all <laughs> about to get cussed out over there. No, we're. Uh, now, who is that? Me and Kevin already had a different conversation. All right, let's go. So here's one of the things that also I thought is it. So there's this point in, this, in the documentary where you. This is five white guys. Mm -hmm. All of these music heads. Mm -hmm. All of these folks are sitting there. I'm talking about him. And I'm watching it, and I'm literally saying, why, was, why is it Clarence in one of those positions? Because, I, because they're talking about his brilliance. They're talking about just how this dude, just how smart he is. And I'm going, why in the hell isn't he in one of those positions earning the millions and millions of dollars and not having to have a couple of his friends bail him out when his record label goes under and loses the radio station. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and, and I thought about other African Americans who just as smart, just as brilliant, but never got to sit in that top seat. Look, I agree. Uh, I think in the unique case of Clarence, I think Clarence ultimately decided he didn't, he loved making deals. He loved connecting people, but he didn't enjoy being an operator. You know, so even though he had two record labels, he had a radio station and all that, what he liked most was the deal and the hunt. So I think in the back half of his life, he said, that's what I like to do. This is, the, you know, so I'm going to focus on that. That said, there are so many enormously talented people who do not get the shot that they deserve. Uh, and the opportunity to prove themselves, the opportunity to mess up, Mm -hmm. and then get a second and sometimes third shot. Um, and that's a shame. And hopefully this movie will inspire more people to ask that same question that you just did. Took it three years to do this. Mm -hmm. um, an enormous number of celebrities who, 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 who were in this. And you watch it and you go, dang, who didn't this dude connect with? Absolutely. And here's the thing. He didn't just connect with them, work with them, do a deal with them. Those people still feel a very deep connection to the point when, when you call and say, we're doing a documentary for Clarence, they all say yes. Two presidents say yes. You know, uh, two of the greatest sports legends ever, Jim Brown, you know, Henry Aaron say yes. Unbelievable. But they say this guy made a meaningful difference in my life. I, I love the Coca-Cola story in Hank Aaron, uh, how Clarence just called. And, and I don't use the N-word, but basically he, he, he tells his white CEO, black folks buy Coke. A lot of Coke. And <laughs> I mean, he's just straight up. And the thing is, he walks into the boardroom. He pulls his chair up to the desk. So basically, it might as well be his desk as much as the CEO's desk. Doesn't say hello. Just cuts right to, we buy a lot of coke. And that's the beginning of the negotiation. Now, you know how it's going to go if that's step one. <laughs> right. If, if that's the beginning of it, you know how this thing is going to happen. Absolutely. What do you, Clarence is 88. I called him a few days ago, and he said, man, I've gotten more calls from around the world than I ever have in my life. Um, there's so much we can learn from from watching a documentary like this here. I think about the Jerry Weintraub book, uh, that documentary. There was so much I learned reading it in terms of how you deal with people, how you negotiate, how you visualize things. What do you want, a young African-American, or somebody of any race, and because Netflix is also worldwide, there are people all around the world seeing this. What do you want them 
to learn from this that they can use, no matter what their field is? Clarence's ability to evolve is unbelievable. This is a guy, I mean, ninth grade education, Climax, North Carolina, sharecropping, which is virtual slavery, right? That's not a promising start. But somehow he made the most out of any window of opportunity he was given. And he was able to rise to the occasion to the point that he's sleeping in the Lincoln bedroom of the White House. He's doing deals with the top power brokers in New York and L.A. It's because he never hit a ceiling where he wasn't competent anymore. He kept having curiosity. He kept learning. And he never said, here's these external reasons that have stopped me from getting what I want. He always checked himself and said, how do I grow to be ready for the next thing? And that's a lesson for every person. I don't care what level you are right now. Last question. You've got a ton of stuff. Yeah. When I interviewed with Harry, when I talked to Harry Belafonte, he did. He had 800 hours worth of content when he did his uh, documentary. Mm -hmm. um, what the hell are you gonna do with all the rest of that stuff? Because I'm taking it's a bunch of stuff you have that you haven't even used. Yeah. There's a bunch of stuff. There's some amazing stories. I just, you know, mentioned one to you. There's a right, which was the one about uh, Joe and the um, and going to the stadium. That wasn't in the documentary. Right. We have an easy hour of stories, just great stories, great deals, great everything. So, look, this movie is so successful. Perhaps we can find a way to show folks some more stuff. Uh, this is called The Black Godfather. Uh, if you uh, have not seen it, you want to see it. It is an amazing documentary. You guys did uh, a, a great job with it. And, and I just appreciate uh, that Clarence uh, laugh for the story to be told. Because I think we need to hear more about figures like him and hearing their stories uh, and also celebrating them while they are still with us. Absolutely. Uh, thanks to the Avon family, thanks to Netflix uh, and the amazing crew uh, that dedicated their lives over all those years to make it happen. Okay, one, I'm like a Baptist preacher, one final question. Okay, you did this here. Is there a doc of someone? living or deceased, that you would love to do? There's several. There's people that I want to do, and there's also subject matters Got and it. events. Got it. Right? So, I mean, this is my first feature-length documentary. Uh, it seems to be very enthusiastically received. So in addition to feature films and television and comic book and live events, I'm going to mix a little documentary action into my uh, future line of product. All right. Sounds good. Yes, Always sir. good seeing you, my brother. Always. Appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Yes, sir. All right, folks. Back to that whole Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. Marijuanastock.org is another great investment opportunity. If you were lucky enough to invest in, uh, in their last crowdfunding campaign, uh, you, of course, now know that those folks are invested in a publicly traded company. They raised a ton of money in a few months investing in legal marijuana farms. Now, of course, they have a new investment opportunity, uh, which is as good or if not even better. I'm talking about industrial hemp CBD. For those who don't know, the hemp plant is the cousin to marijuana with a much higher concentration of CBD, which means hemp CBD gives you all the medical benefits of marijuana without getting you high. Now, until recently, hemp farming was practically illegal in the U.S. and heavily regulated by the DEA. However, the 2018 Farm Bill changed all of that, making it legal to grow hemp CBD in the U.S. and creating one of the largest commodities worldwide. They need land to grow all the plants, which makes for an incredible investment opportunity. And that's where our good friends at 420 Real Estate come in. Their business model is real simple. They buy land that supports hemp CBD grow operations and lease it to high paying tenants. That's right. They are hemp CBD landlords and you can get in on the action. You can invest in the crowdfunding campaign for as little as 200 bucks up to $10,000. Like I said, you may not want to miss out on this opportunity. Go to MarijuanaStock.org. That's MarijuanaStock.org to get the game and to do it now. Now back to your Roland Martin Unfiltered video.